we are, I don't know, we, we, we love being here. We love uh, being here at Rescue Church. We love connecting with you guys, uh, Pastor Adam and Pastor Sarah. We're, I can't tell you how many times I've said, every time we worship with Sarah and Aaron, yep. I don't know, it's almost like something in me comes alive again. It is, yep. Would you say? Oh, yeah, she said a portal opens. Listen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's just this anointing that just, when we're connecting in worship, that's just undeniable. Every time we worship together, I get new songs. I get new ideas. I hear, you know, and um, I want to release a word for your wife. Um, when we were worshiping, I, I, um, with listening to her play, and um, I, I kind of went out of just like being like extra overly spiritual with it, and I was listening to her as a musician, and I was like, I got this impression, and I was like, she's actually going to be featured on many albums. Like the world doesn't not know what they're missing. She has it. And they're gonna come after her because of what she's carrying. And on these features, she's not going to be controlled. They're gonna say, just play what you feel. And they're gonna accept it and receive it. And many will hear from these records, others will hear who is that person, who is that person. And she will be, she will be called to record and be featured on many albums and many other stages uh, besides uh, Rescue Church. I saw a vision of her um, worshiping. Or, um, um, I didn't see the name of it, but it was almost like being at like a Jesus culture kind of conference and they needed a violinist and they called Sarah. And so uh, I just want to release that, that the Lord is going to open up doors and opportunities for her to be featured on many records, many, many, many records. You will hear her strings on radio. You will, she's not asking for that, she's not about that. We're not about that either, but I'll take it. <laughs> and so I just wanna release that. So Father, we just thank you for the anointing that is on Sarah right now, Lord God. We thank you that she is already prepared. She was already prepared. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <laughs> Man, um, Adam, when you were talking just a second ago just about what God has called us to do at City of Love Church and you were talking about feeding the, um, you know, what we do there at City of Love Church. We believe that we're in Isaiah 58 project um, in the message version. Um, it talks about the kind of fast that God uh, calls a fast. Yep. You know, we our fast is, you know, and if we're not aligned with God, like we don't really know what a fast really is. But this particular kind of fast is not a Daniel's diet. <laughs> this particular kind of fast, when you read it um, in the um, message version in Isaiah 58, it talks about creating basically a meal and preparing it as if your family is going to sit down and eat. But don't eat it. Give it to the homeless. He said, this is the kind of fast. This is what I call a fast. It's preparing. It's smelling the onions and the, the, the peppers, the steak, and all of that. You got the mashed potatoes. You got all the greens. I hope I'm not making you hungry. And your whole kitchen is like, and everyone's ready to sit at the table. And you say, this is not for you tonight. This is for the homeless. Put your coats on. We're going outside and you give up your plate. And then it talks about inviting the homeless into your homes and all these types of things. These are things that we don't really wanna do because it's uncomfortable. We say things like, I'm not really sure if they sit on my sofa, they're gonna have bed bugs. These are, real, these are real things we think about, right? And these are the things that God has called City of Love to. But it talks about, it says, if you do this, it says, you'll be known as those that can fix anything. Yep. That's what it says. Uh, it says you will take the old ruins and build anew. All these things. And then he says, you'll be known as those that can fix anything. He said, if you do this, I'll turn the light on for you. Jesus. 
So we're Isaiah 58. And so I know that that Isaiah speaks to me because I was on the other side of the table once and needing the food. I was, on, I was the one on the other side of the table needing someone to pay my light bill. I was on the other side of the table. So the building that I'm in today and that we own today is the same building that my family used to eat at when we were homeless. And so the Lord has turned things around in such a way to where now I'm giving back to the community in the building that we used that saved my life. We own the building now. And so this, that, thank you. It was in a building that um, online, when I saw the number we could afford, it was a building I was actually telling Luke, nope, I'm not calling those people because we don't have any money and I'm not want to hype the church up that we're great by a building. And the man said, if you have a dollar, I'll, I'll give it to you. So it was donated 10,000 plus square foot building with a, f a, f a fully functioning kitchen, same kitchen I used to eat in. That is where we're worshiping now. And so this is just a testament that if you just do what God says, yes. just do what God say. I know feeding a homeless ain't sexy. I know it ain't cute. I understand all of that. I know it's not grand. It may not get you on TV and all those types of things, but it's not about that. This is really about surrendering your life and saying, Lord, I'll be the vessel, whatever that is, whatever you want me to do, that's what I'm going to do. And so, and I'm not going to sit here and tell you um, and, and, and lie and tell you that I haven't got off course because that happens. You get frustrated. You sir, am I, should, I, should I be doing this? Should I be doing that? But every time we realign, every time my heart and my mindset goes back to what God says, I can't tell you the phone rings off the hook. Every time we get focused on the first thing, the phone rings off the hook with people sending money, trucks of food. I remember pulling up, we had an 18 wheeler pull up in front of the church uh, and we had, it was, like, it was like an emergency call. Everyone, stop what you're doing. Get down here. 18 wheeler trucks is pulling up with food. Universities closing down for the spring and they can't keep food in the freezer. So they bring all of the food to City of Love Church. Someone called and says, hey, we see what you're doing online. There's a grant uh, that, that is for you. My wife was like, what do we got to do? The lady was like, nothing, just sign. I already did all the work for you. All you have to do is sign. This is what happens when you're aligned with what God has called you to do, right? Sweatless victories. Sweatless victories. <laughs> Sweatless victories. All right, so I wanted to just uh, just encourage you um, uh, today. Um, but we're here to talk about fam. Where's that? You had family. Yeah. Where are you supposed to be? On? We're here talking about family, marriage, family, and ministry. Um, marriage, family, and ministry. And one of the things that uh, I brought up yesterday, I talked a little bit about um, the family hustle. Like, what, what are you, what's your family called to? What's the, every man should get a vision for his home, right? And so what, what's your family vision? Um, and uh, we didn't mention this yesterday, but uh, we were gonna do something different today, but I was laying there when my wife, I was able to think last night because my wife wasn't snoring, and so. <laughs> And so I said, oh, God, I can hear you clear. <laughs> and he reminded me of a series that we did at, at, at our church um, called The Uncommon Family. What does it look like to raise an uncommon family? And so I want to share just a little bit uh, with you guys today concerning that. Um, some of this, um, I think this is for everybody. I think it's not just for married couples, but if you want to get married, of course, you can take these notes as well. Um, and so um, let's get uh, right to it. Um, when I thought about the word, when he gave me the word uncommon, I started thinking about, uh, of course, what's common. And most of the times what happens is, um, um, let me back up. So I started thinking about the word uncommon. I started thinking about between the difference, the difference between the two, common and uncommon, common and uncommon. And most of what we see today is common. It's just common, yep. right? Uh, what's common? What's common is uh, there's no order in homes. That's common. What's common is parenting 
has become more of a friend buddy system in the home. That's common. Common is the kids are going to tell you what to do and control your emotions and control the temperature of your home. That's, that's common. What's common is families don't say grace anymore. What's common is families don't pray together. What's common is families don't fast together, but the parents will fast with the church, but not with the children. This is common. What's uncommon is the opposite. What's uncommon is we're not seeing these things. These are the things that we want. This is what we need to see. To be an uncommon family, you want to pray with your kids. To be an uncommon family, you want to fast. To be an uncommon family, we want us to do what the scripture says, as we do. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Straight up. I don't care. My son is home from college. He is a grown man. If you're coming home from college for the weekend, under my roof, you are going to church. And you will not make us leave. <laughs> we don't have that. We don't have that issue with my son. We don't have that. But if that was the case, for me and my house, we would serve the Lord. Guess what? If a family member says, hey, cousin, I'm down on my luck. I need a place to go. Cool. You're 40 years old. I understand. We get down on our luck. But you're coming under my roof. For me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. So you going to church with me. When I'm going to church, you're not sitting here with a remote in your hand. Because what am I doing? No matter who it is, no matter what the situation is, I'm keeping the order of my home. I'm keeping the vision of my home, right? Keeping the order and keeping the vision of my home. And so if we're going to be a uncommon family, we're going to look at 1 Peter 2, um, 8 and 9. An uncommon family is like the peculiar kind of thing. And it reads this in the New Living Translation, and he is, excuse me, he is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they do not obey God's word. And so they meet, their, they meet the fate of that was planned for them. Excuse me, verse 9. But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into the marvelous light. Verse 9 is speaking of being a peculiar people. Different. Uncommon. If God is calling us to be that, there's no difference in our families. Our family is called to be different our than the world. Our family is called to be uncommon, all right? So I want you to get this in your spirit because a lot of things that we do that's common is we're afraid to be different because we, we don't want to be looked at as you just, you're different. We think that's a, that's a bad thing. Being different is a bad thing, right? Uh, we want to get in our spirits, we want to get in our hearts that if God, if we're following the Lord, if we're following Jesus, we are called to be peculiar, we are called to be different, we're called to, we don't do things the way the world does things. That's right. We do things different. The government that we're under, that we're in, is different. Yeah. It's a different set of rules, it's a different system. But most times what happens is the world is doing everything they can and as, a, as one who served and worked 16 years, I think 16, 17, 16 years in the school system, I have witnessed the schools, I don't talk about this much, but I've witnessed how the school system forces their ways into your home. I've sat with, in district meetings, I've sat with principals, I've seen it, I've, I've, I understood that it's a numbers game. I understood, I, I used to say this all the time, uh, we had so many kids that were getting trouble in the school, and I didn't understand why they weren't like suspending them or giving them like detention or it just they just weren't doing it until I went to one meeting and I found out it's a numbers game because if the principal keeps writing them up which is the right thing to do and keeps creating the order then when it's time for his review he gets demoted so it's a numbers game and so what ends up happening is our homes 
are being, are getting hit with the systems of the world. And every time our child comes home, we have to undo what the school did. Anybody ever witnessed that? Just have to undo, well not Adam, because they. <laughs> no games. Becoming common has, has been the norm. But we have to be, we have to be uncommon, excuse me, different and peculiar, all right? Like I said earlier, uncommon families pray together, uncommon families eat together. I didn't do that, I didn't go through that. Uncommon families respect one another, worship together, rejoice together, sacrifice together, uncommon families. This is what uncommon families do, okay? Uncommon families show that uh, in, in their hearts towards one another, there's no selfishness. They give themselves to one another, yes. right? Well, we're living in a, in a day and age. Uh, right. So w when we were younger, uh, we had to share socks. We just had to. Now my kids don't have to share socks. And they, they make that known. <laughs> you got your own socks, you're not wearing mine. You got, your own, you got a black t-shirt, you're not wearing mine, right? And so we're doing all we can to say, listen, we share no matter what. It's the, it's the Acts chapter two, all right. so. I really want to, what I want to do is be more uh, principle driven. I'm really trying to stay with my notes and not freestyle because I want you guys to walk out of here with some principles and not just me necessarily talking about my story necessarily. And so I think the best place to go, let's go to Genesis 2 verse 15. We're going to talk about um, Adam and Eve in the garden, but I want to talk to you about one of the most dangerous forces, one of the most dangerous spirits that I think we ignore, we had a conversation about this last night, is you wanna make sure that you are discerning that there is a third voice in your home. That's right, oh yeah. You wanna make sure that you are discerning that a third voice hasn't entered into your home. We're gonna talk about this in a minute. Verse 15 says this, the Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. Verse 16. But the Lord God warned him. Everybody shout warn him. Warned. You may freely eat of the tree of the garden. Verse 17. Except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are surely to die. Let's jump to Genesis 3, 1. Now remember that. All right. Genesis 3, 1. The serpent was the shrewdest in all of the wild animals, of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the fruit of any of the trees of the garden? Okay, so let's, let's back up. Let's back up. In Genesis 2, it says God put Adam where? In the garden. He put Adam in the garden. It jumps down to to chapter 3 and it says that Eve had a conversation with the serpent. God gave Adam the vision for his environment. Eve was not there yet. But in verse chapter 3, here he comes, the serpent, having a conversation with his wife. Where is Adam though? There you go. That's right. Where is Adam? He's sitting in the back watching his wife talk to a snake. Now watch this. Why is Adam, why is, this, why is Eve, excuse me, having a conversation with the serpent? How can she do this concerning what God told Adam? Adam must have shared with his wife, what God said. Because she wasn't there. That's right. She wasn't there. So now, we as a unit are on one accord. Then it says that a serpent comes up to Eve and has a conversation. Where did this serpent come from? Out of nowhere. This is what's happening in our homes today. Third voices are creeping up in our environments and we don't even realize it. Excellent. 
influences, influences, voices creeping up in our homes and we don't even realize it. Now watch this. Now we can be all, we can be on point. I'm fasting, I'm praying, I'm discerning, X, Y, Z, boom, boom, boom. And then you wake up one day and say, wait a minute, my house feels weird. Something feels strange in my environment. Yeah, anybody ever just wake up, feel that? Something feels a little off a little bit, right? And then you go to find out it's one of your kids. <laughs> Real talk is one of your kids. Because even though, so the enemy knows that you're watching out. But a third voice can creep in through your kids. I'm going to show you how. This is a little old school right here I'm about to say, but I'm going to show you how. A third voice can enter into your home through television, radio, social media, and company you allow to come into your home to visit your kids. A third voice. This third voice in the garden destroyed the family of Adam. Destroyed his family. This third voice, so there's so many ways I can, I can go with this serpent thing, right? But I'm a, I want to stay right here with the family. This third voice comes into the garden, has a conversation with his wife. One, that's a problem. Because as the head, our jobs yes. is to step in front. Because submit means for the wife to submit under our protection. Protection. It means to be protect. Our job yep. is to protect. Yep. Adam is standing watching his wife get chewed up by a snake. Yep. Don't think there's no snakes in your life. Watch this. Uh -oh. I might get in trouble for this one, Adam. <laughs> please, please invite me back. <laughs> this, is, this is scripture, though. If you look at, now I'm going to give you a Greek and Hebrew. Yesterday I was in. Yeah. <laughs> if you look at the word Eden, Eden actually really means presence. The garden is the physical place. Eden is the presence of God. A snake was in the garden of Eden. You can be in church in the presence of God. And sitting next to a snake. Don't turn to the right or the left right now. Because we're not talking about nobody in here. <laughs> How did a serpent creep into Eden? The presence of God. Here they are having this I was supposed to stick to my notes. Can I just flow? Let me just. Here they are sup supposed to be in the presence of God on one accord, but they having this problem. And so now there's division because of a third voice. Some of us have family members that have influenced us and have caused division but in our marriages. I know someone, I know some people. <laughs> Where the wife is so influenced by her sisters. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> so influenced by her sisters that it has it is, has caused such division between her and her husband. Yeah. Even family members. Oh yeah. Hmm. We had a conversation. I don't know if we mentioned it yesterday. I think we talked about it last night. I know it was yesterday sometime. <laughs> where I have a family. Oh, it was yesterday. Yeah, yeah. I have a family member, and I shared it yesterday. And the point of me keeping this family member out of our environment is so that my children aren't influenced by their spirit. Yes. Yeah. But it's a hard decision to make. Yeah. Because there's a love there. There's a desire there. I want you to be there. But because you believe that we're not receiving you the way and all of how you want us to receive you, you believe we don't, we don't love you. That 
hurts. But for me and my house, <laughs> we will serve the Lord. So even though it hurts to keep a family member away, I'm protecting yes. my seed. God told Adam, tend the garden and keep it. Another translation says, take care of it. To take care of it. So as the story goes on, she, the wife influenced, watch this. Uh-oh, might get in trouble for this one too. The wife influenced the husband to disobey God. Ooh. The wife influences the husband has the vision. God spoke to God spoke to him first. She wasn't even there. She wasn't in the picture. He has all the tools. He's heard from God. He can't say he didn't have a relationship with God. He heard from God. Him and God partners in to name animals. He says, bird. God said, good. That's what I was thinking. You know, <laughs> dog. That's what I was thinking. You know, <laughs> we good, Adam. We don't want to call you. You, you thinking how I think you feel how I feel. Yeah, so then the wife comes. God prepares his environment for him to live in to bring his family into a set environment. But then we find out that there is turbulence. There's something going on here. But then the wife gets influenced. Adam's job is to step in front and make sure that they keep order. But he didn't, that's the first problem. That's right. That's the first problem. Two, well, that's the second problem. First problem is he should have discerned that there is something in his environment that's off. That's that's off. off. Yeah. Okay. It also doesn't say, and it doesn't tell us that Adam had a meeting with his wife, but we know that he had to have shared it because what the serpent is saying, did God really say? And this is what the third voice, uh, a third voice will also do. It will cause you to question what God told you to do. Yep. You ever have an idea and you're so excited about this vision or this, this idea and you go share it with somebody and their response ain't what you think it should be? And then you be like, well, maybe, maybe I didn't hear God then. Maybe God didn't say that. That's because sometimes we share our visions and ideas with the wrong people. Yep. Okay? <laughs> so as the story goes on, she influences Adam. She eats. He eats. He, he should have rebuked her right there. I mean, he, he should have rebuked her. He should have. He should have got with her. The story should be said, and Adam reset. None of that happened. None of that happened. But he didn't do that. Instead, he took the fruit. He ate of it. Their eyes were open, and we know the story. It says that they hid themselves. This is what a third voice will also cause you to do. Run away from God. Yep. Run away from his presence. Move out of the order of where we're supposed to be. So as he ate of it, the scripture says that Adam hid himself, and he heard the voice of God walking. Now, watch this. This is good. Because even in his sin nature, he could still hear God. Church won't teach that one, though. Even in his wrong, he heard God. He heard him coming. He could hear it. God says, where are you, Adam? Right? We don't really want to need to get into all of that. He says, where are you? He says, I hid myself because I knew I was naked. God says, who told you that? That word told there means counsel. Or doctrine. Who have you been listening to that stripped you? It says that they were naked. Everything that Adam had of God at that moment, he felt he didn't have it anymore. The word told. Sometimes what happens is we sit and we receive counsel from the wrong people. From the wrong people. Okay? He says, Who told you that? I'm almost done. We're going to eat. <laughs> Y'all like, we can out of here fast today. Adam. Thanks, sweetie. 
God deals with Adam. And the scripture says that they were driven out of Eden, out of the presence of God, out of the Garden of Eden. This is, this is what we have to watch out for. I have seen this even in the natural. I've seen when families or a family member, husband or wife, was so influenced by an outside voice, they lost everything. They're in the presence of God, in their home, and then was driven out because of, they, because of them listening to the counsel of a snake. I'll let you share at the end. Because I ain't going to get the mic back. So. <laughs> they're, st they're sitting here having this conversation and didn't realize that they were going to lose everything. This is what disobedience gets us. Here we are. God sets us up. As we've been talking about the promised land. Everybody has a promised land. Everybody here has probably said, how many of you got a dream house? You have a dream house. How many of you like where I live is good enough? No, no, no. Good enough people. <laughs> so everybody didn't raise their hand on each one. So I'm a little confused here. But how many of you have a house you desire? This is, I'm not, you're not getting rebuked. <laughs> we have a really nice house, but it's not our dream house. No. So, and we're, we're going after it, you know, so <laughs> we want it. If, if we don't get it, we're content. We're good. But we all, we all have a dream house. We all have this promised land, right? All right. And so here God sets them up there. It's perfect. Yeah. They, it wasn't, un, he didn't have to work at the sweat of his brow until after the fall. Go ahead. Didn't have to till after. So he set up, everything's good, boom, and that's what God will do. God will give you the desires of your heart. Put you in the place that you desire. Some of us, we just work for it. Some of us, just it's favor through your talent you work for it. Some of us, God just, it's just favor and will set you up. And you know what we always say? God, when you give me that house, I'm going to worship you in that house. <laughs> I'm going to have the church over my friends over we're going to we're going to plug up the keyboards we're just going to dedicate this space to you and then five years later you didn't do it one time the place you said was dedicated to god you forget about it you forget about it but then god says if i give you this place there are times when god said if i give you this place this is what i need you to do and then we don't do it Many have done the opposite. Many have listened to influencers, outside voices, and done the actual opposite. And then wonder why you lose stuff. This is what happened in the garden. So there's an order to how God sets up marriage. The man is the head. The woman is the helper. The man is to provide and protect. Everything is set. But in the kingdom, there are precepts, there are laws, there are concepts, there is a rules. All of these things are set up for us to live by. Yeah. But if we don't, there's a problem. Yeah. Here's what we have to remember. We cannot keep getting mad at God because we keep messing up. <laughs> I'm going to tell you guys the truth here. My wife will tell you. I don't pray for stuff. I just don't pray for stuff. I don't, I think I can remember when I was younger because of conditions, like I, I did do something, but I don't pray for stuff, right? right? What I learned to pray for was what I believe I need according to God's will, like what he's called me to do. Like this is kind of, you know, it's different. That's right. I don't necessarily pray for, for stuff. Right. And so I've learned not to do that um, because I because of the conditions I grew up, I had to learn how to just trust God. I just I know he's going to do it. I know he's going to do it. Right. If God shows me something and the house, the house we live in, we were searching for a house. I didn't pray. I didn't pray. I didn't. We searched for the house, found a house online. I said, that's what I want. 
That was it. That's what I want. Right. And so here God gives us his house. And the first thing in my mind, well, I was a little nervous to do this. I was like, this is where we're going to worship the Lord. I wanted to say it, but I ain't say it because I was like, because we may not. <laughs> we may not watch it. <laughs> I'm not really, really sure, sure what's going on here. No, we have. I'm just saying. I believe we're in the favor of God right now in this uh, place in our lives because we're keeping our word. Because we're keeping our word. And what we've decided to do is what we've, uh, is even, we do this, we do this, even when our marriage is going what we believe is good, we still do marriage counseling. We still sit down with others and uh, we just check off. Because you never know what's hidden there. You never know what's hiding. You just never know, right? And so uh, we decide to just continue to work on our marriage. And I think it was like last year, like we were really, really having like hard conversations, like just like learning how to communicate together and just how do you communicate um, with not having the you know, frustrations while you're talking and the, I learned that from her though. I wasn't, I wasn't, I told y'all what I was, I was slamming doors, all kinds of stuff. Just, I was just, just, just a wreck, just a wreck. Just a wreck. And I, I, I noticed something that when I, when, I, when I get my bearings right, I notice that I don't feel the presence of God like that. Mm. And I started noticing and started wrecking, thinking about Adam and what his assignment was in the garden. It was to tend and keep. That's right. Tend and keep. That's my responsibility. That's, right. yeah. That's my responsibility. So when I'm slamming doors, angry, yelling at the kids, go play outside. That's why I, I, I do that all the time. Go. I'm trying to figure out why you're not outside. This yard. This yard. I don't know why you're not outside. And uh, it's, it's not tending my environment and keeping my environment. It's not. And so... Uh, uh, it's not just about working. It's not just about paying bills. It's about also the temperature of the spirit in your home. That's right. So, good. Mm -hmm. so you can pay bills. I'm the provider. I'm this, that. You, you know, uh, uh, and, and give all your money to pay all the bills. Uh, but spiritually, your home is a wreck. It's a mess. Right? Because money and uh, money and uh, uh, money and, and careers and if you can make six figures, you can make 200,000, you can make 300,000. That, that doesn't mean the presence of God is in your home. That doesn't mean, and I learned this, that doesn't mean that you have a great job, you have great furniture, your house looks great, that there's peace in your home. Okay. All right. I was, I was adopted in 11th grade by a white family. They took me out of the projects, right? Um, brought me into their home, and uh, uh, there was a noticeable difference in culture. <laughs> a noticeable difference in culture. I mean, night and day. Yeah, it was, yeah. And it was the first morning I've ever waken up in the morning and hear birds. Chirping. <laughs> but I'm, 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 as I'm looking into this camera, I am not lying. <laughs> but I didn't like it. Because it was strange land for me. It was a strange, it, I'm not used to it. Waking up and the mother, I could talk about it because I call her mom Donna. We're still in touch with her today. She'll knock on my door, hey, sweetie, good morning. I'm like, if you don't get out of my room, what's wrong with you? What do you want for breakfast before you go to school? Not used to this. Yeah. I'm used to waking up, car system, boom, 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 <laughs> arguing. <laughs> like this. And we'll hear birds, we'll hear pit bulls. <laughs> like, it's crazy. It's, 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 it's. I'm not lying. <laughs> I had to get used to this new environment because dysfunction became normal. Wow. 
Dysfunction became normal. When people, when I tell people and share with my friends the things that I, I, we did in my home or we were allowed to do in our house, and I'm not going to tell you what it was, but, <laughs> but the things we were allowed to do in our house, I'm thinking that they're going to be able to uh, um, 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 connect with that because I'm thinking everybody does this. They're like, nah, we're not allowed to do that. <laughs> Where you say you live at? <laughs> Dysfunction was normal and anything in order to me felt out of order. It was weird. And I had to learn, it wasn't until I was older, got older, that I learned uh, what I was experiencing was vision and order and no vision and out of order. So when you grow up in these dysfunctional environments and it becomes normal, you're looking for this everywhere you go. So I've learned to function in dysfunction. So I thought that's what I was doing. Functioning in dysfunction, in a dysfunctional environment. That's what I just, but I moved into with this Miss Donna, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ralph, that's their name. And I moved in and uh, we were getting allowances. <laughs> I'll come in from school, there'd be $100 on the, um, every Friday. $100 on the, um, oh, in case you guys wanna go to movies or something like that. <laughs> movies? I ain't never been no movie. Uh, get your hair cut every two weeks. It was clothes. It was, oh, I was at the mall, and here's a pair of jeans. I ain't never got no jeans from the mall. N never. Oh, dinner time, get your plate. I walk upstairs to my bedroom. <laughs> they come knock on the door. Uh, we don't do that here. Come on back down and sit at the table, and they would say Grace. Now, I knew grace, but not together. And they would say grace. And quickly I started recognizing, this is what I've been missing. So I had a serious conversation with Ms. Donna, and I'm not joking. I said, Ms. Donna, thank you for everything that you've done. But I want to go home. She says, why? Mr. Ralph, I remember him, he said, you're not used to this. I said, nah. I, I was missing the dysfunction. I felt like I couldn't live, like I, I needed it. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, I felt like I needed it. I, I needed to see the drug dealers on the corner, the, 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 the dice games. I needed, uh, yeah, like, it gave me, it made me feel like I was living for something. I'm not telling you no lie. That made me feel like I had a vision. If you asked me when I was younger what I wanted to be, I tell you, a kingpin drug dealer. Yep, I see. Yep, yep. That, oh man, I would sit at the kitchen table and look outside and watch how they move. I'd be like, okay. I promise you, that's it. I said, I got it. Okay. And I, I repeated what I saw. I repeated what I saw. And because all I saw in my environment was dysfunction, and all I, I didn't see basketball. We didn't have super, we had what they call park legends. We didn't have guys come back and give back to the hood because they made it to play ball overseas and or they made it to the NBA. We were just park legends. And so I didn't I ain't I didn't want to I didn't want that. I wanted the the rims, the gold chains, the dice, the fat pockets. Going to school with a thousand dollars eighth grade, going to school with a thousand dollars in your pocket. This is what this is what I wanted. But this is what a corrupt environment will get you. Now, some of your environments, I don't, I don't believe your environments at home is this, but I'm just really getting into yeah. what mine looks like, yeah. right, just to highlight, because I can only talk about mine. But this is what, when you don't allow the Holy Spirit and you don't uh, bring kingdom law and rules into your yes. home, then uh, you're subject to this. Yep. 
to dysfunction. At whatever level, you're subject to dysfunction. And so what ended up happening was I went back because I needed the dysfunction. It was a rush. I didn't know and understand what spirit was operating at the time. We get a knock on the door. A week later, it's Miss Donna. Looks my mom dead in the eyes and says, we really want your son to come live with us. This is what she said. We really want your son to come live with us. We really see he has great potential. Wow. I was one of the best athletes in the school. Football, basketball, f f f you name it. I could do it. She said, but I really want, we really want to see him uh, at his greatest potential. My mom looked dead at me. And she says, get your clothes and get out of here. I felt rejected. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand what my mom was doing, but I felt rejected. She understood that I was living among serpents. She understood that I was living in an environment that was causing me to just live a life of dis dysfunction. Yeah. I was being influenced by the third voice, drug dealers. The th this being influenced. Grab my stuff, got in the car, and I'm driving, and I'm silent. Guess who I'm mad at? Miss Donna. <laughs> because I felt she was judging my environment. I felt, so in my mind, I'm like, go get my brothers and sisters then. But her assignment was me. Her assignment was me. Get there, I go in, a, I'm slamming doors in high school. I get there, slam the door. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Ralph, leave him alone. Leave him alone. Their son Barry comes in, hey man, my mom and dad really, really like you. They really, they, they've seen you play. They've seen you run. They've seen that. They just want to help. I had such an addiction to this environment. I stayed there a year and went back. It was almost like a relapse. I just couldn't kick the habit of being in this environment. Wow. You know what Ms. Donna did? I can't make you stay. Not only did I leave, I dropped out of school. I went back to selling drugs on steroids. I'm catching trains. I'm doing a whole, that's a whole nother thing. That'll be in the book. Get the book when it comes out. I'll tell Adam when the book comes out. <laughs> I'm sorry I, I deviated from this, but I think it still right. means something. Yeah. I apologize. No, no, no. Go back into this environment. I'm going crazy. Getting locked up, running from cops, up and on trains. You know, um, I remember being, um, I remember I got, I got a, I was, um, I was selling drugs down at a bar and the uh, uh, task force raided the bar. So I seen them coming through the, I seen them kind of when they pulled up because the door was open. So I turned, put everything that was in my pants in the pool table, shoved it up the pool table and I moved away from the pool table. They came in, raided took all the stuff, locked everybody up, didn't know whose it was. You know, you sign your own self out, the whole nine. But they came for me. They showed me pictures of me getting on the trains, getting off the trains, 30th Street train station in Philadelphia. They showed me. They said, we're going to get you. We're going to get you. I lived the whole of my life. All I was doing was living what I desired. I was living what I desired. I was determined to be a kingpin drug dealer. Because my environment taught me this. That influence yep. influenced me. Yep. Life goes on. I get myself together. 
I married this beautiful queen here. She saved my life. Later, I talk, years later, I talked to Miss Donna. And I'm talking to her, and she's crying. I'm like, she's crying because I left. You didn't give me a chance. You didn't give, you didn't give Ralph and I. I'm, that's, that's what I'm thinking she's going to say. She said, I'm so glad to see you where you are today. She said, I knew you were destined for greatness. And she's crying, she says, the reason why I came after you so hard, I didn't know my purpose until I met you. And I was like, huh? She said, I did not know what I was called to do when I met you. God called me to black kids in the inner city. Now, I jumped ship early. But I didn't realize and know that she went and got two more and financed their college. Thank you. She financed it. She put them through college. One got an opportunity to be the wide receiver at Virginia Tech with Michael Vick. Boy, could play. The other one played at another school up somewhere up this in New York somewhere at a smaller school. Both of them got degrees. She said, that was my purpose. When I met you, I found my purpose. But it was this environment, even though I jumped ship, I learned the difference between environments. Yeah. Yeah. The value of order yes. and dis or dysfunction. I, I learned that. And so now my, what I want to see in the house, in the families, in your families, is that, you, that, you, uh, that you're functioning the way that you were designed to function. That your houses des are function uh, the way that God designed for it to function. That the man steps in the role and stays in the role right. that he was designed for. That the woman helps the way that she was designed to help. I know what it's like to grow up in Hades. I know what it's like to grow up in hell. I know what it's like to wake up every morning and you go to eat cereal and at the bottom of every spoon that's in the kitchen is burnt because your dad smoked crack and built his, uh, uh, boiled his crack cocaine on those spoons. Every spoon in the house. Every spoon in the house. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to not be able to have regular cups to drink out of because you had to save the canned goods, bend the tops to uh, use as your cups for years. Dysfunction. Wow. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to be in dysfunction and environments. But God created and gave us an order. He gave us an all we have to do is follow the order. Yeah. Just follow the order. Wow. Do everything you can. If you have kids, do everything you can. If you want kids, do everything you can to create an environment for your family to win. Yes. Yes. Everything. Yep. Did I give a scripture? If I, if I, if I didn't give a scripture, I'm going to give a scripture so I can say I preached. In Genesis 4, 8, I'll close here. In Genesis 3, 23. Sorry, sweetie. Then we'll go there. So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden, which technically means they lost their home. They lost their home. The wrong voices can speak deaf into your home environment. Now in Genesis 4, 8. Sorry. A third voice will plant seeds and cause a spiral effect between family members. Watch this. One day, Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out to the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his, uh, his brother, Abel. As a principal a point that I said, a third voice will plant seeds and cause a spiral effect between family members. Here's what I didn't know. As we shared yesterday, we want to get 
make sure that we get healed and delivered from generational cycles. Yes. One brother kills another brother. Adam didn't kill Eve, but one brother kills another brother. Just because it doesn't look the same doesn't mean it's not a generational cycle. Watch this. They disobey God, created in their environment a reality of darkness. So anything that's in the reality of darkness, that family is now subject to, no matter what. This is why we have to do everything that we can to obey God. Because even though, even if we get it wrong, whatever that thing, the exact thing we get wrong, doesn't mean our kids are going to do exactly that. But because of the, under the umbrella of darkness, anything is subject. Yep. Anything is subject. this help anybody today? Okay, okay, let's stand. If you are not married, desire to get married, my encouragement to you first through this weekend is that you begin allowing the Holy Spirit to really begin dealing with your heart and the reality that you may have grown, grown up in. And if you are dealing with any type of generational cycles, that's the first thing. That's the first thing. I like what Adam said yesterday. Um, one of the things that we want to do is if you are uh, dealing with like, like family members that you may have uh, crossed you wrong or you may feel like, oh, if it, wasn't if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be dealing with this. The one thing that he said I thought was very powerful was you have to move in forgiveness. You got to move in forgiveness. So we have forgiveness, right? Uh, and we have generational cycles that we may need to deal with. And if you're not married, we want to just help you so that you're not moving into this. Or when you get married, that you don't take this bondage into your marriage. But even if you are married and you recognize that I'm dealing with some of these things, one of the things that I always challenge our church is be honest with yourself. Yes. yes. Be, we telling ourselves so much, people be like, y'all tell, tell too much. I'm like... <laughs> We're always like, they said the best parent in the pulpit is transparent. So we're going to try to be as transparent as possible. You don't need to know everything, but you're going to know a lot. You, you'll be able to get the picture. You got to be honest about what you are dealing with. You got to be honest and say, you know what, I got this from this, this skipped my dad, but my, grandpa, my grandfather dealt with this, though. You have to be honest with some of the things that you may be dealing with. Because what you don't want is to create an environment for your kids to live in or your wife to live in. You, want, you really want a peaceful environment. You don't want an environment of struggle. You don't have to have an environment of struggle. You don't have to. But you got to be honest with yourself and, and say to yourself, this these things, this is what I'm dealing with. This is what's wrong. And you got to allow the Holy Spirit to take it from you. You have to do that. The second thing, the third thing, that's the second thing. The third thing is that allowing the principles of God's words to be on the forefront in your house. You got to allow the Holy Spirit, the, the principles of God's word. Why? Because it helps create order. It helps establish order. And order is what's necessary, is, what's, is what we need. It's the thing, out of order is what's common now. It is, can I, can I? Even in church. Even in church. Sorry. I agree, I agree. Even in church. Out of order was so common. Right, I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> Don't judge me. I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> My mom encouraged me to take my girlfriend upstairs in the sixth grade. Wow. Now, I'm not going to tell you, you have your own imagination, so. Mom's got to get out. 
<laughs> but that was normal in my neighborhood. Normal in my neighborhood. Now, I know my situation may be extreme and very rare. I understand that. But these are some of the dysfunctions that I dealt with and had to deal with even growing up when you're dealing with the spirit of perversion. I was introduced at an early age to the idea when I should have been doing my homework. Some of these situations, a lot of these situations are common in homes. They're common in homes. Man, I could talk forever, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Come on, let's lift our hands. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you right now for everyone that is here. God, I thank you for allowing me to share uh, part of my story, my testimony. Father, I, I pray that someone was blessed. Father God, I ask right now, Father God, that you would go into every home and undo everything the enemy has done. Father, we thank you right now that you are setting uh, the right perspective into our minds, into our imaginations, into our hearts. Father God, that we must live a life um, that is pleasing to you. Whatever is out of order in our home, Father, allow the Holy Spirit to convict us to get it right. Anything that is out of order. If the kids are out of order, Father God, we thank you. If the marriage is out of order, Father, we give you glory, honor, and praise. If our churches are out of order. Father, we thank you. God, we bless your name. Before we turn it over to Adam, I just, I just feel the strong need to just encourage the men. Um, and I just declare there's no fear for you to step into that place of leadership, to step into that place of authority, even if you are occupying a tenant. I just hear that God is saying that he's giving you the grace, he's giving you the vision and the mission to lead your family. And I felt like there was just like a spirit of fear. So we just tell fear to go in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you that your perfect love has come to cast out all fear and every wicked imagination that will war against every man in here believing that he can't do what you have created him to do. So Father, I thank you that the standard of your word will begin to rise in every home and every leader in this home. And I want to close with an activation if you are married. And if you're not married, single women or single men, I want you to take notes. Because when you get married, I want you to do this activity. But wives, I want you to look at your husband. And I want you to say to your husband, you have... Just go ahead and look at them in the face. I know some of you are worshiping, but go ahead and open your eyes. So this is, we want this to be direct. Yes. I give you permission to lead me. Excellent. <laughs> I give you, come on, say Go ahead. I give you permission to lead me. Yes. Yes. And, and there's a cloud of witnesses in here. <laughs> I, I give you permission to lead me. Seriously, there's a, there's a transference. There's just something that I feel like God is doing. There's a grace. I give you permission to lead me, and I will submit to your vision. I will submit to the vision of God in you. Yes. I believe in you. And then the last thing, you can do this. You can. Is it bad if I sat down? In Jesus' name, we seal this. Amen. Amen.